Thank you. Sit down. Sit, sit. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you to my wonderful panel this morning in Singapore to discuss what is one of the most important uh, themes of, of the year and on the 21st century, how we decarbonize our economies, our lives. Um, Andrew, let me, let me start with you, and if you could kind of do a bit of a back in time and look at what has happened over the last year in terms of decarbonization, progress on climate change, or lack of progress. When do you look at that, and you have to give us a bit of a grade, how are we doing? Is it an A plus, or is it an F, if you look at the last year? Uh, look, the last year has been incredibly interesting from a climate science perspective. Uh, the signals the climate is giving us, you'd probably give that a 10 out of 10. It's just so obvious now. But that's, that's an F from the climate. That, that is, thank you, climate, for making it so obvious to even the biggest moron that we are <laughs> going straight into global heating. In terms of the human reaction, uh, I'd probably give it a 1 or 2 out of 10. Most leaders have leapt on to the safety of geostrategic issues without running the numbers. Who's going to die more? out of lethal humidity, global warming, or even a hot war between superpowers, let alone between Russia, Ukraine, Hamas, Israel. It's, the number's very clear. Global warming, global heating will kill a multiple more people. So if you're a leader, I think you should also always hit the crocodile, which is closest to your canoe. And that crocodile, the biggest, ugliest croc, is global heating. Thank you so much. That's, that's, uh, so climate is effectively a 10 on 10 in terms of the signal, and our response is basically nowhere to be seen. It, it, is, it is so fractional compared to the urgency of the problem. Jan, um, you're running a publicly listed company uh, in a similar uh, fashion. When you look at uh, your conversation with shareholders, with investors over the last year, how those conversations have evolved um, and, and it has become more urgent, less urgent? Um, are investors more interested, less interested? Because we see a lot of investors say this is one big problem, but then what investors are doing is a bit different at times. Well, I think, look, I think the decarbonization of the building space where we are active is, uh, is not a choice. Um, that's a, a must for a company like Holcim. So we are have to prepare and, and even we have lately, some people think the ESG talk is softening, but, but that's just uh, maybe the mood of the week. Uh, the decarbonization of buildings, so we have about 38% of all carbon is emitted uh, in the construction phase and more of that is in the operating phase. So that's a must and any responsible company in that industry has to decarbonize and has to go with uh, fast steps and that's what we have been doing. We reduced our CO2 footprint by 40% in only the last three years. And uh, why it's a must to decarbonize, we, it's not a miracle. We have a lot of uh, technology available and you have to just uh, deploy them properly and decarbonize your business uh, step by step. But you mentioned that uh, perhaps investors are not so much ESG as they were a year ago. Do you see that as a new trend or is as as perhaps journalists like me are basically talking about it now and thinking that this is a permanent shift, but you, you, don't, you don't agree with that? If I was to understand investors better, maybe I would be much uh, richer. Um, <laughs> no, but look, uh, the investor, they, some are short time, short term, focus some long term. I think for the long term, it's all clear and why the world has other hot topics at the moment. Um, uh, maybe the ESG is came to a second level, but this is a very short-term perspective. You better be ready as a company to walk the talk and decarbonize your business. Hans, a similar um, uh, theme in terms of money. Uh, you, you come from a different angle, uh, venture capital. Where is that kind of early stage, the big bet in new technologies? What do you see in terms of money flows and money interest? If I use your 
grading mechanism. I think I give an A on innovation. I give an A on intent and willingness to deploy, and maybe a C minus on actually deploying it, because it's hard, right? But the, the money is coming in, and we got a little bit uh, uh, an adrenaline rush during the heydays of 1920 when the SPAC uh, market sort of confused people. And our sector has a tendency when things are good, people get too excited, and when things are bad, they get too depressed, and we are somewhere in between right now. But uh, a lot of it is, is, is coming in our way, which is exciting. Okay. Cindy, um, what is the view from, from Asia? Because this region has different needs that Americas of Europe, everyone shares the same ambition that is decarbonized, but not everyone is in, in the same stage of the energy evolution and, uh, and also economic development. So how do you see the, the equation from Asia? Thank you. I think when we address energy transition, we have to look at the context, which is very important. In Asia, um, we are faced with the energy trilemma, which is a factor of energy sustainability, energy resilience, as well as energy affordability. Asia is a rising uh, population uh, and there's rapid urbanization, which also means that the demand for energy is projected to grow rapidly. In fact, by 2040, the energy demand in Asia will double. And uh, we have a problem here because the uh, bulk of the energy mix in Asia is fossil fuel based. However, there's also hope because Asia is, uh, especially Southeast Asia, we are very fortunate to be blessed with abundance of renewable energy. Now the challenge will then be how do we deploy technology, infrastructure and capital to harness the uh, abundance renewable in a form that is predictable, secure, affordable. Thank you. Um, please, before I forget, uh, you could be sending questions to the uh, panelists, which I will ask them. Uh, you use, need to use the, the app. I think that we will get the QR code that you need to use. But uh, at any time, feel free to send the, the questions. I will be getting them on the, on, the, um, on the device. And then I can put those questions to um, our panelists. Uh, when we look at uh, decarbonization, it is a journey. You start doing new things. And um, the, the first steps usually are easier because of the low-hanging low fruit. Um, next steps get more complicated. I, I have my personal experience. Putting solar panels in the house was relatively easy, even with the nightmare that planning permission in the United Kingdom can be. And I, I, you, you are on, 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 on the business side. I, I have a lot of sympathy now about planning permission and dealing with governments. <laughs> Mine was my local government, but Jesus, that was difficult. Then you, you go into the materials industry and you do more insulation. That's more complicated. I'm now into the cycling to work. That is really hard. Um, so when you look at things that you think that we should be doing, on this path to decarbonization, and we need to focus on things that they are real, that they are on the money, that the technology is there. What do you think is the next big thing that we should be trying to do? And a question for all the panel, but Andrew, let me start with you. What is the next thing that you say, this is real, this is scalable, it is on the money, and we have the technology to do it. Let's do it now. Okay, so um, certainly we have all the technology we need for solar, wind, hydrogen electrolyzers, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, that's all basic technology. It's all there. What's lacking really is the will or even the character of leadership to get on and use those technologies, to stop putting up excuses um, and just get on and, and do so it. So it's policy, what we need to solve for that? Uh, look, it's not just policy, it's the character and will of business leaders to push policy. This is not a... Um, this is not a resource we're running out of for solar infinite, wind infinite, renewable energy infinite. The resource we're short of is really the character of leaders to actually bite the bullet to answer the question, when will you stop burning fossil fuel? Hmm. And answer it truthfully, and say, if it's a great answer, is this decade. Average answer, first half of next decade, wrong answer is after 2035. And, you know... That question simply needs to be put to leaders. And if you leave it to your workforce, say, work it out for me, they'll go work it out. 
No, it's really the character of leadership which is the scarcest resource right now. John. Uh, look, I think uh, for building uh, and construction, a big way forward is uh, recycling of uh, construction demolition materials. And that was basically not used in the past. And now uh, this will be a, a big future for um, construction industry and especially for Holcim. We have last year alone, we have recycled 1,000 full truckloads every single day into new products. And we need the governments to follow to allow us in the building codes to use more recycling material compared to virgin material. And, but there's nothing to complain. We have to uh, propose the solution and then the building codes, you know, they have to be properly tested, but that's a big area for us. So we are growing, we have already 7 million tons of construction demolition material recycled last year. And this is growing at 20% uh, every year and we want to be the recycler of those materials in all the metropolitan areas. So, T Talk to me about numbers, how those recycling materials look like to a final customer who is buying. Is it going to be more expensive? Is it actually cheaper? How, how that compares? For you, it will be only a minor premium um, on the more sustainable solutions. But uh, I know the, the product is great. It's a local product, construction demolition materials. We recycle it to use it as a raw material or to even uh, replace virgin material directly with it. So we have one of our most advanced cement types already we introduced in Europe. As 25% of the product is construction demolition material. You can imagine that the recycling of such a material is rather easy and no downcycling can be fully reused 100%. So it's actually quite a high return operation. Hans, you're investing in dozens of different companies. I mean, when you look through that prism, what do you see today as the most exciting opportunity for real, scalable, on-the-money uh, decarbonization technologies or, or initiatives? So the roadmap to decarbonize the global economy is pretty straightforward, right? You start with decarbonizing supply. Wind and solar is probably a good winner there. Not the only one, but a meaningful one. You electrify demand. You start with the vehicles, you go the home heatings and other places, and then you, you know, clean up the rest with clean molecules for the real hard challenges that both of you are facing here. So the roadmap is clear. Where we, I think we have the biggest disconnect today is sort of dealing with the intermittency of connecting supply and demand on, on the electron. Uh, you know, the P, you know, power will go up two times over the next decade or two in this region, you know, Elon Musk is out there saying it's three times because the generative AI data search takes 50 to 100 times the computing power and the electrons of a Google search. So um, you have that, but the peak power might be five times. So you somehow have to connect the two with either wires, whether that's to Malaysia from here or to Australia, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but, uh, or you put, use chemical storage, there are a lot of developments, a lot of attention we are paying to that, long-term seasonal storage. It could be scalable solutions like dispatchable microgrids using renewable natural gas, etc. a big role, making the communication smarter between demand and supply, telling your vehicle charger, don't charge at six o'clock when everybody does it, do it at midnight. Um, so those are three big themes that I, I think will um, will pay a lot of attention to. Storing heat, right? 25% uh, of the world's emissions energy consumption are around heat. We invested in a company called Rondo. They basically take 200-year-old technology bricks and heat them up, and it's much more efficient than anything else out there. So a lot's happening. There's not one silver bullet, unfortunately. The, the, you know, Noel said it earlier here today. It's not black or white. You know, different answers for Australia, for Singapore, for Switzerland. And, um, but there are a lot of opportunities because a lot of money will be spent. Technology around the grid and the kind of how we manage the electricity grid seems to be a big area. And sometimes I'm surprised at how unsophisticated our grids are as to the fact that I only got a smart meter about a year and a half ago, which is almost... I suppose that in computer terms, it would be like saying that I have only got internet about yesterday. <laughs> uh, why is that it's taking so long to make our grids smarter? What is the big difficulty? Uh, I think Cindy mentioned probably one of the key bottlenecks. It's, we call it the trilemma. Everybody wants to go clean. You know, from the corporations to the, you go in the schools today, they all want to work on it. 
And then they realize well, it has to be secure. And you know, I'm from Germany. Originally, they learned the lesson. They were thankful that the winter was not that cold because they would have basically uh, not gotten the heat and the electrons. And it has to be affordable. And, and sort of doing that, it, it's a really difficult equation to solve that, in our view, requires innovation and collaboration. The grid that you're referring to has been built over 100 years. One of our partners, the Southern Company, built the last nuclear power plant in, in, in the US. Took them decades and a lot of money, but that will be operating for 80 years, right? So you cannot just ignore the money that has been spent, otherwise it's not affordable. Cindy, what do you think that for this region in particular are uh, technologies, ideas on decarbonization that we can be pushing now? Well, um, I think scale matters. So when it comes to grid, I think reliability of the grid is the topmost priority. For example, in Singapore, we have one of the world's most reliable grid system. The, uh, if I recall correctly, the last statistics that was uh, reported, we have a disruption of less than a quarter minute for the whole entire year. And that was back in 2016. So to have a reliable grid, you need to have very reliable power generation. And uh, one of the uh, large scale, utility scale power generation unit, which Capo is currently building, is a 600 megawatt hydrogen ready combined cycle gas turbine. This is significant because upon commercial operation, this uh, CCGT will be hydrogen ready. It can uh, take up to 30% of uh, hydrogen by volume. And uh, as we all know, natural gas is by far the cleanest source of fossil fuel. It is always on, flexible and dispatchable. Whilst we are building this and securing the sources of natural gas to ensure reliable power generation, we also future ready the power generation by making sure we have accessibility to low carbon hydrogen. And this is where we are very optimistic about hydrogen as a potential zero emission energy uh, vector. Now the challenge lies in accessibility to continuous storable source of hydrogen. So what is that energy vector or derivative that we can transport and store hydrogen in? And this is along this line of thinking that we are developing green ammonia as a potential source of uh, low carbon and zero emission uh, energy. So um, in order to produce low carbon ammonia at a very competitive cost, you have to pursue location where you have very competitive leverized cost of renewable. And for that, I don't mean instantaneous generation of renewable, I mean firm renewable generation. So this is where hybridization becomes very important. We would love to chase location whereby you don't have only just a single source of renewable energy, but multiple sources such that we can hybridize and optimize the round the clock competitive renewable. So Australia is one such location where um, we are pursuing a uh, hydrogen hub project in uh, central Queensland. We could hybridize the production of renewable with palm hydro, solar, and of course, a bit of battery storage to ensure continuous electrolysis of hydrogen and then synthesis into green ammonia. And by the way, scale matter in order to drive down cost. If we were to produce ammonia and transport and store it for power generation, we might as well aggregate demand to use ammonia for the decarbonization of hard to abate sector, like marine time transportation. And this is along this line. Singapore is creating a end-to-end uh, -end, uh, value chain for the uh, manufacturing of green ammonia, transportation, and potential power generation and uh, bunker fuel end use. I think coming together of sectors and large-scale application will help drive down costs over time. Andrew, you, you are uh, obviously very interested on, on hydrogen. <laughs> and when, when I speak to some executives on, on, on the sector, perhaps they are coming from the fossil fuel industry that they are now exploring hydrogen. One of the things I hear is, yeah, everyone is talking about hydrogen, but the buyers are not committing to buy. They are not signing uh, offtake agreements for 10, 15, 20 years that will justify our investments. 
Are they saying that to me because they're coming from the fossil fuel industry and they don't really want to invest? Is a reluctance from buyers to, 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 to commit for long-term um, offtake agreements on hydrogen or green ammonia? What, what trends do you see there? Yeah, look, there is a reluctance um, at the early stages because people are wanting to see a regular supply. People like Cindy, I'm really pleased to be on this panel because I'm not seeing shortage of character and leadership here. But you know, it's this chicken or the egg scenario, which is why we've decided just to go first um, and so you start basically producing are, green are building with, and You're saying that I'm going to produce the supply and the demand will come. And the demand will come. Look, I've actually done it before with, uh, with grades of iron ore, which were considered to be not commercial. They're now the biggest volume pr product in the global iron ore sector, which is the biggest um, sh shipping by tonne sector in the world. So, you know, I, th I believe we know how to do this. There is a massive demand for green hydrogen. Uh, it's great to see 30%, Cindy, GE, uh, screaming at my doorstep saying we've started to produce turbines which can use 100% LNG or 100% hydrogen and our, and our buyers are buying these machines of us and then saying where is the green hydrogen? And so it, it is... It's not easy to get these industries going. Government has to support them. Government has to get in behind them. That's government's entire role. We shouldn't forget that when oil, oil got going, it was $1,600 a barrel. It got a truckload of support because it was popular. That's because people wanted a more con convenient source of energy. Now, it's much more dangerous. We need a source of energy which won't destroy us. Mm. And the simple fact is that the human race... A bit like how I tease my American friends, you know, we'll, we'll do the right thing after we've exhausted all other options. And I think from an investment perspective, this world is going to go green because the, the obvious destruction in front of us, if we don't, is becoming clearer and clearer. So I think, A, let's keep putting capital into it because it is going to get a good yield. B, have risk takers like myself step up and supply Cindy with green hydrogen or green ammonia, whatever she wants. We need uh, great green ammonia for our own trucks, which are now operating green ammonia for our own trains. I'll be going out to one of Singapore's shipyards this afternoon to see the world's first green ammonia fuel cell ship. We're getting this ecosystem going as a supplier and as demand. So that Cindy gentlemen is where we want to push the green hydrogen ecosystem. Hans, in, in the world of energy, sometimes we, we talk about the energy trilemma, the, the, that triangle of how clean our sources of energy are, how secure or reliable they are, and how affordable they are. When you look at that energy trilemma, what do you see today, particularly looking at investing in uh, decarbonisation technologies? Well, I, I touched on that uh, briefly bef be be before. What excites us is that there's so much enthusiasm from corporations to get involved, right? So the utilities that control the network, that they want to be a part of that. The oil and gas companies who are really good at drilling things and transporting molecules around, they, they want to get involved. So that fact that they want to collaborate and get in a room together with those innovators is, is, is very encouraging. We, we the way we operate as a firm, we create our shark tank. I think you watch British television, it's called the Dragon's Den, anybody's seen that? So we put those experts in a room and they talk among each other, they learn from each other and they learn with the, uh, with the innovators to come up with the solutions. So that, that, that process is amazing because when we started you know, uh, EIP before Paris, it was eight companies that had a net zero commitment of some sorts. I think we added 1,200 last year. It's 2,400 now. So the, that train has left the station. And, um, and that's really the exciting part. Just to comment on yours, chicken and egg, but they need to be in the same hen house because it's very diffic difficult to transport that egg to, to the other places. I just wanted to say... Well, not to as say, ammonia. Say, 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 we, we've allowed a lot of money, but yeah. in America with the uh, IRA, you know, $3 a kilogram, that sort of that makes a big difference. And there are places where that will come very quickly. Yeah. And also in America, you can put the production system next door to the demand system. It's just a pipe. Yeah, that, that's and right. And hydrogen loves pipes. So. Yeah. That's easy in Texas, in Oklahoma. Yeah. It's harder in Saudi. It may still happen. Uh, yeah. Australia. Hans just went, uh, mentioned uh, the IRA. Um,
uh, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, a lot of support, uh, subsidies, perhaps better permitting um, coming from, from the U.S. government. That is different in other places, but what do, you, what do we need from governments to help the decarbonization path, and particularly, is it about money? It's the biggest thing that we need is uh, more subsidies, or is it about um, perhaps uh, you know, regulation, permitting? Um, Jan, what, what do you want to see? But you are, you, are, you are based in Europe. What do you want to see from, from the European government? I, I think I join Andrew. We have to start. You know, it's, uh, we shouldn't complain too much and waste too much time on the different dilemmas we are having. I would say we have different situations. So uh, to decarbonize my company, which is a manufacturing company, we have to talk about uh, renewable energy, maybe green hydrogen. We have different formulations. We have the process. We have the final solution for the customer. And the decarbonization steps are, are all the same for all markets, but depending on the local situation, they vary in intensity and speed. And we see that at the moment, the European Union, with their Green Deal, is, let's say, the most supportive uh, framework, economic framework, to decarbonize fast, as they put a significant <laughs> price or incentive scheme on CO2, as they provide regulation, they have border adjustment mechanisms. So, so that's the most, um, and for us, that's an um, incentivized framework. And then you have other markets which have maybe on, on a different level. But, but I would not complain and just say, we, let's get ready. And maybe the speed and the intensity is a bit different, or we all have the courage like Andrew, and we just, we just do it, and we have the chicken and the egg in the same moment. Cindy, what do you think that Asian governments need to do in terms of supporting the industry, particularly with money? <clears throat> I think um, maybe you can put it into three big buckets. Right? One being the cost in, in parity, how to narrow the cost gap versus, I mean, the green molecule versus conventional molecule. RRA simulate production. There's a lot of production subsidies. But I suppose uh, industry policies in terms of demand or usage uh, would be helpful to encourage and nudge off taker. So I think a bit of uh, subsidies or CFD to close the gap on the uh, demand side would be useful. That's number one. And number two, I think a lot of uh, sector coupling will be very useful. Say, for example, ammonia is not unfamiliar to the fertilizer industry or to the chemical, like the explosive industry. But it is being traded as a chemical commodity. So buyers or off-taker are familiar with buy, buying spots, one-year contract, two-year contract, small volume. If you look at ammonia as a store of energy or as a fuel or as an energy in itself, we are used to underwriting long-term contract. So I think the definition is a new definition and a new end use. So coming, the coming together of sectors, understanding the standards, the, uh, the, the ways of commercial contracting, uh, who bears what risk, will be very helpful. So I think uh, standardization, uh, sector coupling will be very, very useful. I think third and most importantly is the uh, time, long-term technology roadmap. I think uh, we have to support directionally places where R&D dollar and technology development dollars, skill and capacity upgrading are being placed in. So directionally, I think hydrogen and its derivative will be the uh, norm for the new energy system. So however, it takes time and I hope uh, the other thing that will help encourage fast tracking of this is shortening the permitting time required. There's a lot of hoods, developer, operator, and investors need to jump behind in order to actualize large-scale projects. Per permitting a, an authority approval, you know, coming together of uh, cross-border markets uh, will be very helpful to uh, encourage speedier decarbonization at scale. Thank you. A reminder, if you have any questions from our panelists, please use your app to, to send the questions to me and I will receive them. Uh, to, to all the panel, we were earlier discussing of the things that we should be trying to do and, and, and speed up in those technologies. But let me ask 
the question in a different way now, and is we have been on this path of decarbonization already for a number of years, and we, we know perhaps or we have now experience of things that don't work. We try it, it's good to try, but it doesn't really work on the scale that we were hoping or it's too complicated or it turns, turns out to be too, too expensive. Is anything that you will say, we try it, and I don't think that that's going to be a solution, or it's not going to be a solution on, on greater scale, and we need to move on from that. And Hans, if, I, if you don't mind me starting with you, what is the, the, the things that you have learned? This is not going to be the, really, the, the solutions that we were hoping. There are so many. Last year, they got, there were 10,000, 55 companies worldwide. They got a million dollar investment in our broader sector. The amount of innovation out there is incredible. So the technology we need are there for the most part, or getting there closely. So it's a lot about deploying, de deploying those. And uh, just following on the, the, the last question, sometimes you know, the government, as an allocator of capital, I'm not sure it's helpful, but they can help a little bit getting those deployed. A lot of it is about industrializing, deploying technologies that, that are developed, that are in the trenches. People know of NIMBY, I'm assuming. Have you heard of bananas? Anybody heard of that? You know, build absolutely nothing near anyone anytime soon. That, that's kind of what... Uh, oh, hold what on a second. You, you need to repeat that more slowly because you told me that earlier. Yeah, I, I was very familiar with NIMBY, but the bananas acronym is completely new to me. So go, go ahead, so bananas. build absolutely nothing near anyone anytime soon. And that applies to bringing the cheap electrons from Quebec to New York, 10 years waiting for the planning process that applies to the copper mines, as some of them are sitting for 10 years, 15, before something happens that will have to, that is applying to the nuclear industry and, uh, and many other places. So a lot of it is deploying, industrializing what we have today. They will get us 80% there. Some of the tougher problems, you know, from the steel making to the built environment to the cement, that will take more development, but 80% of the challenge is deploying the things we have economically, and, uh, and there's not one size fits all for, for that. John, is anything that you have learned over the last few years that it doesn't really work and that you, you decided, no, we're going to try a different approach? Well, I think for me it's the opposite. Uh, as a company, we did the Net Zero pledge, I think, four years ago, and then we, you know, it took us quite some courage to make a roadmap and then we can do net zero. And when I see now the innovation we had on the way from, and the momentum we have from uh, renewable energies to electrification of all the logistics we are having, also all the way down to carbon capture technologies, I'm rather surprised about the speed and the scalability of those innovations which we need. So I have the opposite to report. I'm rather surprised about uh, how fast we are moving on a technology side. Andrew, is it something that you have tried that you, you have became a bit like, no, that, that's not working? Oh, look, it, it's to, the pure reliance on batteries. My organisation is one of the largest investors in, in batteries and battery technology, and I think batteries have got a long way to go. But when we worked out that if we try and just run the world on batteries, it's never going to happen, it's very finite. Why would not happen? Because it's finite material. A battery with a tank of hydrogen, which is an infinite material. It's simply a function of renewable energy, electricity price, electrolyzers, and you have as much hydrogen as you'll ever want. Hydrogen with a battery is the solution. Battery on its own is very short-sighted, and we're moving away from batteries on their own. And, you know, I said to my engineers, look, I want a hydrogen fuel cell truck. These are trucks, you know, not much smaller than the size of this room. I said, look make me a hydrogen fuel cell truck. And they said, there's not even one invented yet. I said, okay, how long is it going to take? They said, three years. They said, well, no, 100 days. They said, we haven't got a truck to retrofit. I said, 99 days. We don't have a shed to retrofit it in. 98 days. They said, stop, stop. We'll have a crack at it. That first truck, hydrogen fuel cell truck, rolled out of a shed in 93 days. So if we really try, if we really have a crack, which you're seeing on this panel then we can, we can make this difference. I would to say rely on batteries just because it's easy. That's going to be very short-term and lead to a bigger problem. Put hydrogen with a battery, now you've got the global solution. 
a big difference over the next uh, at least few months, perhaps years, if, if we listen to the um, different central banks of the world, is that we are going to be doing decarbonization in, a, in an environment of much higher interest rates. Uh, we started this path with money, which was almost free, uh, and now money is more expensive. Uh, as a holder of a mortgage, I'm beginning to realize that. <laughs> how that. How that is impacting the way that you think, uh, and, and, and also how is that impacting the investors who are putting the money, because you know, at the end of the day, they can put their money in treasuries and get almost 5% um, risk free, you think that the American government is risk free, um, that obviously the premium that they are going to demand for the returns on, on new projects in, in venture capital is going to be very, very different. So Hans, how, how high interest rates are affecting your, your business? It, it makes a big difference, right? We've got used to two decades of you know, really, really low interest rates and venture capital loves that. You know, when, the, when that change happened, the overall venture market valuations came down by 50%. Fundraising is down 80%. So it's a bit of a cold winter for the general VC market. Um, our sector, the energy transition is faring better. So it's down 30% or, or so. And we're still you know, standing up uh, between generative AI and, and climate change. It's still more positive. But people have to be more thoughtful on, on what, what they do. And the, again, I said it before. During those heydays of the SPAC market, the, the valuations were crazy. Some people came in on two weeks to diligence throughout the evaluation and were hoping that they can arbitrage it in some SPAC story within a few months and make a ton of money. And they, you know, they all collapsed 95%. So I, I think it's a healthy reset uh, for us, for the industry on, on the innovation venture capital side. But people will have to be more thoughtful uh, in, in that interest rate environment. Because can can we do made. decarbonization at 5% interest rates? Say it again. Can we do decarbonization at 5% five inter, five interest rates? Yeah, we have. Rate? We have. I mean, the, 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 the beauty about decarbonization is that at the end of the day, it makes economic sense. I mean, the, the doing good is one good motivator, but the way the, you know, the, the, the electric vehicle overall cost structure will be, it's cheaper to drive an electric vehicle and it's more fun, right? So that, that, those are the real motivator and that will get us a long way. There are some areas where we face a monopoly with China or where it's something that is really hard, like hydrogen, a little bit of government helps, but ultimately if it has to be economic. It has to make economic sense for the energy transition to work and it will, I think. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we are running out of time, so I think that we are going to leave it there. But I think it's a very important message that for the decarbonization to work, it needs also to make economic sense. Business needs to, to thrive while doing the, the right thing for the planet going green. Thank you so much, and join me, please, thanking the panel. Thank you.